mentor Joseph Rantree in this city, creating New Earswick, a place where people who've worked in his factories, people who are managers, people who have nothing to do with his factory, could live in green and pleasant surroundings. And that's New Earswick, which anyone in York will know. The housing that we still manage to this day, but which much more significant than the fact we manage it, perhaps even more significantly, became the blueprint for housing across the Western world. Suburban housing is built on that model. The detached house or a terraced house with a garden and a fruit tree, taking people out of the slums of York and putting them into decent housing. That enlightened businessman who did that changed the face of housing in this country. And in doing so, he left a lasting legacy of how well people can live, how we can break the link between poverty and squalor and in doing so, set a trend for the future. He didn't just leave the housing, he also left a legacy of inquiry and investigation, of finding out. Joseph Rantree and his son Sibo knocked on doors in York and wrote down the details of who was poor and what they were living on and how they were coping. Not quite in the language we use today, there are some things about the fellow drinks too much and the house is a bit dirty, but the same <laughs> principle of recording what happened and taking that information and that evidence to government. And there is a story, and I don't know if it's true, there is a story that when Joseph Rowntree went to see Winston Churchill, then minister, what was then called welfare, he said, if it is happening in York, it is happening everywhere. And that formed the basis for the National Insurance Act of 1911. I say that story because the Citizens Advice Bureau service, the knowledge you have, that really granular detail knowledge, is gold dust in social change just as it is for Joseph Rowntree Foundation, an organisation established a bit before you to do some of the same things that you do, to search out the reasons why there are social problems, to understand social problems minutely, not in grand theories, but in detail, to demonstrate what can be done to influence lasting social change. In the time since our two organisations were formed, almost everything has changed, and yet some things stay absolutely constant. Women had just got the vote when you were formed. We were on the brink of the Second World War, which wreaked devastation across Europe and indeed across the whole world. You were formed at a time of national crisis and emergency. As we went from that last period, that period between the wars, into that devastating Second World War, with everything that came from it bombing on the home front, women going into work in time, ways they hadn't done before, huge immigration through the 50s big structural social changes in our society. And throughout that, Citizens Advice has continued to offer information, advice and support, and continue to gather that evidence of where there is suffering, where there is social detriment, where there is hardship, in a way which can make people listen and understand. Because if we just absorb all that information that you've gathered and just say, that's terribly sad, well, that's terribly difficult. Or indeed, I can fix that person's problem. We've done something. If we aggregate it, it can, in just the same way that Joseph Rowntree did, say to Winston Churchill, if it's happening in York, or in Selby, or anywhere else in North Yorkshire, if it's happening here, it's happening everywhere, things need to change. And I say that because I think we are now at a stage of enormous social change, perhaps as big as anything that the founders of Citizens Advice could have imagined. We are, for a start, at a stage of demographic change that our founders could not have possibly imagined. We all know we are going to live longer and longer, and many of us will have happier, healthier old ages, and that's a huge advance in science. I'm slightly worried that government plays <coughs> a bit of a surprise. In fact, the day the baby boomers arrived, and one of them, we knew there were going to be an awful lot of us heading towards an ever-delayed retirement. We didn't know that was going to happen, but never mind, government thinks it's a surprise. I suspect in your bureaus you're not surprised. I don't think in communities with long-term fluctuating medical conditions, living with long-term illness and disability, for very good reasons, because they're not dying young. I don't think we knew we would have people with learning disabilities living into middle age, because in the past, the family disabled babies died at birth. I don't think we knew we'd have such a different population. But our population has changed, for very good reasons. It's time, I think, that public service and the government 
and the ways our market works caught up with that demographic change. Because every day we see the outcome of that demographic change. People who are told their only route out of poverty is work, and yet people suffering a huge epidemic of mental illness or fluctuating medical conditions, which means for them work is not the only route out of poverty. And certainly, work that's not shaped for them will never help them make that move. So demography has changed dramatically, and we are at the cusp of understanding how that change is happening. Not just who's in our population, but how we live. In Joseph Rowntree's days, and I suspect in 1939, you had some chance as you aged of living next door to your unmarried daughter who could support you in old age. That's an un vanishing possibility for us now. Social mobility, geographic mobility means that older people are far more likely to be living alone and far from members of their family. We have far more single households for some very good reasons. The divorce legislation of the 60s and 70s freed women from what had often been crippling on domestic violence and abuse and indeed just containment allowed them to live independently, but that means we have more one-person households. We have got a changing rate of family life. Families are blended, our stepchildren are all sorts of mixtures in ways, again, that the architect, most of the world, I say, had never begun to imagine. And rising costs mean that in most households, even if there are two parents, the only way you get out of poverty is by having one and a half of those parents working. That demographic change is a constant and it's not going to change. The second thing that's changed hugely in that period is the nature of our economy. And this is more recent, and again, maybe we could have predicted it, but here we are, we're saying it's a bit of a surprise. Globalization, automation, and incre increasingly robot robotization, I still can't say that word, the increasing use of robotics is changing the nature of work. And this, in turn, is changing the nature of poverty. It used to be, and indeed when I started work in the 70s, we used to talk about people getting on their feet, getting a job, getting a training, getting a job, getting housed, and they'd be okay. That's no longer the picture of poverty. People are in and out of work, but never out of poverty. You can be as trapped in poverty if you are working as if you are not. And I don't need to say this to any of you. The changing labor market is in turn changing the face of poverty. Seasonal work, increasingly casual work, Casual work sometimes masquerading as self-employment, but it's not the sort of self-employment I want to applaud. It's simply casual work. Zero hours contracts have all had their publicity. But what we know is that the labour market is a different labour market from the one around which many of our systems and processes, and indeed our thought processes, were developed. So the labour market is a very different one again. And that's a huge transition for our country. We can carry on behaving if work will be a route out of poverty. And we can carry on saying it, ministers can make big speeches out of it. But we know, as Joseph Rancher Foundation and Citizens Advice regularly publish the research, that says more than half of the children living in poverty have adults in their household going out to work. We know that myths of three generations of worklessness are simply not true. Anyone who's worked at the front line knows that. In every group, every household, every housing estate, there are, frankly, frequent women going out to work very hard and still being in poverty, making that hugely difficult choice to leave their children and go out to work and still live in deep poverty. So we know that the labour market is changing in ways that we couldn't have foreseen. And the third thing that is changing dramatically, and I think we are all running to catch up, or some of the very young ones among you may feel that digital natives, but most of us are in our second or third language. I can remember many years ago my grandmother saying to me, do you know, Julia, I think once you're grown up, there'll probably be a computer in every town. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't a stupid woman. <laughs> I don't think anyone could have imagined that there is a computer in every pocket in this room. I bet you, you all have super-powered computers in your pocket. We have different ways of dealing with their data, dealing with information, communicating ideas than Joseph Browntree and the founder of Citizens Advice could ever have begun to envisage. And all of those social changes bring huge threats, but they bring, I'm going to argue, huge opportunities as well, because they give us a different way of engaging with those social problems. We have, over the time since you were set up as an organisation, had some massive historic victories in the fight against poverty. We have, first country in the Western world, 
to break the automatic link between squalor and poverty. It was the case that if you didn't earn very much, you would live somewhere that was squalid. This country has a proud record of having broken that link, and it was possible to live in a decent, not a lavish, whatever the sun tell you or the male tell you, not a lavish home, but a decent home and be poor. And given that I know and fundamentally believe that house is the first thing you need to get out of poverty, how important was that? That huge historic gain is in real peril at the moment. As we see people living in caravan parks, beds in sheds in London, overcrowded housing in many parts of the country. But that was a historic gain that we made because organisations like Joseph Country Foundation and Citizen Advice reflected the information through attention to what was happening to people in poverty, through attention to poor housing conditions, went round in the old days, I can remember photographing damp and then sending it into landlords. We did all of that and we made that change. It's now in peril. Second big change that I think we made, we broke the automatic link between poverty and old age. Help the aged posters used to have an old lady huddled by the fire with a shawl around. All our research shows now that yes, of course there is extreme poverty in old age, but actually we've broken the automatic link. And it is now possible to be older, to be beyond retirement age, and not to be in poverty. Not because you're wealthy, but because you're not in poverty. We are imperiling that huge social change that we got again, because organizations campaigned for it, fought for it, gathered the evidence, showed how things could be better. We're imperiling it the next generation of people coming up to retirement age are so much less well prepared than the last. If you believe, and I know that Joseph Foundry Foundation figures have believed completely, if you understand that two thirds of the people living below the living wage are not, as I think many of us fondly thought, 18 and 19 year olds starting off. Truthfully, I think that was okay because lots of people start off on a low income. But it's actually people in the prime of their working life the 30s and 40s are living below the living wage. That means that for those households, when the washing machine breaks, it's a catastrophe. By the third week of every month, they will be in debt. The idea that people in their 30s and 40s and early 50s are living like that means they face an impoverished old age. And when you add to it the vanishing age of retirement, second big product of our changing demography, the fact that none of us know when we're going to retire, because every time we get a letter it seems a bit further on. That's fine for people doing jobs like mine. It may even be fine for some of you who are doing the jobs we're doing. But I know if I was stacking shelves in Tesco's, I'd find that physically quite hard now. And if I was doing it when I was maybe 70, I suspect I wouldn't be doing it when I'd be facing pain. So that huge victory of breaking the link between old age and poverty is the second thing that I think we risk. <laughs> and we face all of this at a time when not just our current government, but any <coughs> prospective future government believes that what we have to do is reduce public spending. Because everybody has been told the deficit in the financial crisis was caused by public spending. I know, I think you all know, that's probably not true, that all sorts of other things caused a global financial crisis that brought the country to its knees. But we've all been told that to the extent that everybody thinks they know it as a fact. And we won't, in 2015, get a government, whatever happens, that thinks we can revert to reasonably high levels of public spending. We won't have a government, we won't have a choice about voting for a government that believes raising taxation even by a small amount is my help. Which takes me to where we are now, as voluntary organisations with a mission to influence lasting social change. Because I believe this is terribly complicated fast-changing world, when things look so difficult, when we are at a point of such massive transition, just like in 1939, our time is now. This is now the time when voluntary organisations need to really organise themselves to say, we cannot just continue accepting things as they are. And I want to close with three big things that I think voluntary organisations do at their very best. And the first is that we challenge the existing order. I'm delighted that yesterday the House of Lords overturned the government's attempt to stop us being able to take judicial review cases. Because many of you will know that sometimes our biggest single power is to go for judicial review and say this family will not be evicted tonight. 
and they were going to take that fire away. We kept it. We've kept it. It's incredibly important. But challenge is not just about legal review. It's also about our existence. The fact that we carry on providing the information, the service, that you, many of you as volunteers, carry on working and saying it does matter what's happening to our fellow citizens, and we will record what's happening as well as trying to fix those individual problems. We will gather that data and we will challenge with it. It's a fundamentally important part of the role of the voluntary sector. What voluntary organisations do is bring people together in communities of interest, communities of power, that can then themselves be truly powerful. They are able to reflect that experience and connect the experience of people who feel isolated, who are indeed at an who feel they have no power over their landlord or their employer, or indeed in their local authority. And we reflect those voices and that experience to the levels where people can hear. The Quaker phrase, and I'm not a Quaker, but Joseph Rowntree was, speaking truth to power has never been more needed, it's never more important. Because if we can take that experience to make sure that the places where people can make the change happens, we're making the single most important connection, which is the one between citizens and decision makers, and making sure that the citizens who have very little, the poorest people and the poorest places, are heard and listened to in the places where decisions are made. Good luck and thank you very much. themselves as poor. 
in my life, I very rarely worked on an issue where I'd use different language for the people and how they describe themselves. And normally, we are respectful to how people want to describe themselves. People with disabilities, that's what we call them. That's what we call them. So I'm uneasy about the fact we talk about poverty. On the other hand, I'm frankly very uneasy about some of the um, more sanitised language that goes around, where people pretend it's not a real thing. And so the reason I continue to talk about poverty, even though it's an issue, is because I think we need to name it and say there is real poverty. Joseph Rantry Foundation, we're always being asked, what's our theory of change? Our theory of change is that poverty is real in the UK. It absolutely exists. I don't need to say that to you guys, but I have to say it quite often. But it's not inevitable. It is simply not inevitable. It is inevitable that people will have bad luck, lose their jobs, get divorced, get ill. Those things can all trip you into poverty. It is not inevitable that you stay there and it becomes a scar across your life and the next generations. So it is real and it's not inevitable is the message that I hope we can carry on getting across. <laughs> Inspirational and uh, to a degree optimistic because it, do, it does remind us that we do have a lot in common and there's a lot of defiance to what's going on. Um, the language uh, that you describe of people in poverty as being toxic, I think it is, is totally true. I would also say that, and this is at the risk of getting quite self-referential, because my project at the moment is on EU migrants, that the language adopted in the context of EU migrants is positively pestilential. Um, and given that you know, a lot of the new rules that have been implemented are resulting in increased homelessness and destitution of EU migrants, I wondered, is the JRF interested in that dimension at all? Are you doing any work on that? Um, and would you be interested in my work? <laughs> <laughs> we are doing a lot of work, and I'm very interested in your work, but I always say this, JRF is not a grant congress, I have to say that, and we don't respond to applications in that way, but we are, we, we, I chaired for three years something called the Housing and Migration Network, which was a group of practitioners and migrants looking at best practice. We're now funding several big pieces of work about the nature of destitution and what can be done. And I'm particularly interested in the housing of people who haven't got recourse to public funds, which is the ugliest term in the English language. When it was introduced and I was chair of the Refugee Council, I thought it was immoral then. I never thought it would extend in the way that it has. And I strongly agree with you. I think our treatment of migrants and our description of migrants, on whom our economy absolutely depends, is disgraceful. Pestilential is a good word, I should borrow it. <laughs> Hello, Julia. I'm Polly. I'm the head of communications and campaigns at Citizens Advice. Um, we've got ourselves a little citizen's manifesto, which I'm going to hand out to everyone before they leave um, at the end of uh, today, which outlines the things that we would ask any government in 2015 to be able to implement, including 90% of childcare costs for anybody on universal credit and free school meals to receive, to be dealt with de um, decently in terms of education, uh, employment and support allowance, for, it, um, for there to be a proper advice um, uh, strategy for every local authority and for corporations to treat consumers decently. What would be your asks of any government in 2015? Well, I perhaps saw an earlier draft, and I haven't got it in front of me, but I can probably echo everything you said. I think we need to start seeing housing as part of the economic infrastructure, just as much as transport is. It astounds me that we can earmark vast quantities of money for transport when we actually know housing. Decent housing is the bedrock of people's lives. I think childcare is a problem incredibly important part of the economic infrastructure, and yet we treat it as an extra. And I think addressing how you deal with the fact that the labour market is so distorted at the moment, along with all the other things I said about what's wrong with it, we now have no progression in the labour market. You either do a lousy job or a lovely job, and the routes between them seem to me to be really hard. Now, I don't think some of that's the gift of government. I think government has to decide what it does on that. Frankly, it can either intervene by regulating, i.e. setting a higher minimum wage, or it can intervene by subsidising, which is what the tax credit system did. What it cannot do is continue to break the social contract that somebody who goes out to work 40 hours a week is still living below subsistence. I think that's risky. I think it's very expensive. And I think it's hugely wasteful of people's skills. So that would be my top list, but actually I have seen yours and I think we copy a lot of it to me. And it's something you probably touched on, and maybe it's too big a question, but in respect of housing, which I believe is, is core, if you've ever experienced homelessness, you won't realise how much homelessness affects you and it's existence. It's not a lie. 
what steps would you take to maybe overhaul the housing system in this country to ensure that vulnerable people who are in work and out of work have a, a, a better access to safe and secure housing? What steps would you take? I think, feel there's not enough campaigning to actually change the housing system in this country long term for vulnerable people. Is that too big a question? <laughs> 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 um, I think that we need to see the housing market as a whole. I think too often we don't have a housing policy, we have a tenure policy. So a policy for private rental sector policy. And none of that's ever going to work because actually people's housing careers go between them. I think we have to get much more sophisticated about housing and it's partly to do with supply. And colleagues of mine in London will say it's only to do with supply. I don't think it's just supply, but supply matters enormously. It's also to do with how we treat the private rental sector. It seems to me that if people are going to live in the private rental sector, in the large numbers that they're increasingly doing, and forgive me, I haven't got the figures, but I know it's gone up like that because I've seen the graph, and they have still got a six month tenancy for a place that's hugely expensive and not very good, and we, we the taxpayer, are paying for it through housing benefit, we need a different deal. I don't see how you can apply for a job. I simply don't understand how you're expected to do that, and yet that's the requirement we make of people. I don't understand how you can have a family with a six month tenancy. I don't see how you can do it. I can see it suits some people at some stage of their life. But we are paying a vast sum through housing benefit for high rents, low quality, temporary housing. I think we need to start addressing that really rather urgently. And in other countries, not as many other countries as I thought before I looked at the research, but in other countries, it is quite normal to be in the private rental sector, perhaps for 25, 30 years. You have a controlled rent, you live there with some sense of security, you have some rights. I think that's perfectly sensible. The other thing I think we need to address on housing is which stage of people's lives do they do things. We have a model which uses that awful phrase, the housing ladder, as if once you're on a ladder, all you do is carry on going up, whereas actually we you know people's real lives are much more complicated. And that in a lifetime, you may be single for a time, you may be part of a family for a time, you may want to be a tenant in the long term. I think there are lots of arguments for older people becoming tenants again. There's a huge issue about older people's housing. But again, not on a six-month tenancy, I wouldn't recommend.